Hello everyone, we have Nick Nicolas Crosetti with us again. He works at local Whole Foods and he's an expert in the areas of cheeses and uh, wines and also of olives. We had previous programs with him, which you can find recorded on our uh, website. And today we are going to discuss olives and the uh, next series, which is coming up next month on the 24th, we have uh, olive oils. So uh, welcome, Nick. Thank you. Yeah, glad to be here. Um, lots to talk about and love talking about good food. Um, olives are definitely some of my favorites. So let's, let's dive into it. Um, for me, Olives uh, it, it have a, such an interesting history um, that, you know, we're still a part of today. Um, cultivation commercially or like for human consumption goes back like 6,000 years <laughs> um, with some ar archaeological evidence showing that uh, early humans, the earliest humans even used olive oils for fuel um, as much as 100,000 years ago. So here we are today still eating olives, still using olives um, in my house every day, um, but all over the world. So a, a very important and ancient crop for humanity. Um, and there are still evidence of some of this ancient crop around the world, in particular in Portugal, um, there is a tiny, tiny village. I, I, if I remember right, there's only something like several dozen inhabitants. Um, but amid, amidst these um, inhabitants is this large olive grove, um, which stands the oldest olive tree known to exist at over 3,000 years old and it still produces fruit. Um, it's, it, this is just what these trees are capable of, um, which is pretty amazing to me. I mean, thinking that back to biblical times, this tree was already a thousand years old uh, and had nourished all the people up to that point and is still doing so is pretty amazing and fantastic. And you know we're celebrating uh, on your table. <laughs> um, it's also yeah not not just ancient but really important in terms of uh, food source and commodity. Um, there are more acres of land devoted to olive production than there are for apples, bananas, mangoes. In fact, the only two things that I saw um, that were had more acreage planted were palm and coconut oil, which are just the, the commercial fats that we use in everything. Um, so 95% of all olives come from a, a band in the Mediterranean, um, but California produces a, a significant percentage um, and there's a growing South American market um, for olive production and olive use. So um, pretty, yeah, widespread. 90% um, of all oil production goes to oil. Olive growth goes to oil. Um, so, you know, that gets used a lot more than table olives, but um, at Whole Foods Market, you know, globally, we sold more than 3 million pounds of olives last year. Um, so it's not to say that <laughs> there's, there's no olives being consumed or not going to oil production, just most of it is. Um, and yeah, 25% of all the olives sold at Whole Foods Market are Kalamata olives specifically. So, I mean, we have a pretty big olive bar at our store um, in Brookside, uh, some have bigger, some have smaller, but pretty much everywhere you go, Kalamatas are the top, top dogs. Um, speaking of varieties, there are thousands and thousands of different known 
uh, varietal olives to exist. Um, but there's really only 100, 150 that make up kind of the world's production. Um, and whether that's because of um, sometimes they're too small, sometimes they are um, the, the texture of the olives isn't uh, suited to um, making into oil or table. Um, there's just a, a host of reasons that one kind of varietal is picked over another. Um, but of the thousands that are out there, about 100, 150 of them um, are widely available throughout the world. Um, Kalamata definitely being the most popular. Uh, Mission olives, um, which come from California, are, are you can find a lot in a lot of different ways um, or forms. And something called Haladiki olives um, are a big green olive uh, that Oftentimes you'll find pitted and stuffed and, and in mixes and things um, because they are so substantial um, and mild in flavor. They, they lend themselves to uh, going into mixes and, and having things added to them. Um, olives are fruit um, of, and the type of fruit that they're known as is it's called a droop. If you think of uh, a cherry or a plum or a peach, something with a pit in it, that's kind of the same family as a, an olive. And that makes sense. It's a, a meaty, fruity body with a pit in the middle of it. Um, these two links here give a pretty fun and um, extensive list of different types of uh, olives out there and, and kind of a breakdown of um, what makes them um, unique and interesting, where they're grown. Um, some of them have pictures and things. So I, I spent a lot of time just reading about these different kinds that I was unfamiliar with and then trying to track them down and, and see who was selling them or, or where you could find them to try um, because there are a variety of flavors of all from all different olives. Um, and like I said, I, I eat a lot of olives. So um, I'm always on the lookout for the next new good olive. Uh, um, olives are pretty nutritious too, really in terms of calorie density. Um, they Sodium is the thing to watch out for being as um, green olives, fresh olives, uncured olives. Um, they're, while technically edible, they're extremely bitter. Uh, they're, they're, they're not something I know anybody to ever just eat. Um, so frequently part of their fermentation process or their curing involves a lot of salt. Um, so factoring that in, um, they have a lot of healthy fats, um, small amounts of protein, um, and that vitamin E uh, component, which is comes across, is hard to come by otherwise, is really um, important in terms of their nutritional value. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, olives are an interesting uh, fruit in that in that they ripen on the tree at, at different rates. Um, so some of these pictures you can kind of see a little better. Even within the same branch, olives, certain olives will be ripe, some will be not ripe, some will be in between. Um, common misconception is that black olives and green olives are different types of olives, when in fact, they're just different types of ripeness. So all olives start out as green. Um, as they ripen and mature on the tree, they progress towards that purple or black color. Um, and depending on the type of olive or the region or their, their end use, they're, they're picked at different times um, to yield different flavors or uh, flavor compounds. Um, 
oil levels are different. Um, interestingly, too, tree, the trees can produce substantial crops individually, um, but, but rarely year after year. Um, so frequently, it's like every two years, you'll get a, a good crop, but it's every five to seven years, you get a bumper crop. Um, I couldn't really identify why or, or find out information as to what the mechanics were behind that. Um, but I thought that was interesting for something that, you know, could be hundreds or thousands of years old. They, they do seem to have this cycle of um, producing more in that five to seven year cycle. And, and uh, interestingly too, many uh, producers, especially in the Mediterranean, um, rely on hand picking methods not necessarily meaning like picking individual fruits by hand, but um, some have like a stick that they'll whack the branches with to knock off the ripe olives. Um, or they'll have people climb up the tree and shake the, the branches. Um, definitely unique, I think, in terms of food production, the like minimizing of mechanical means. There are like machines that will grab hold of the tree and shake the whole tree and, and catch what falls. Um, but olives, especially the ripe, mature olives off the tree can be fairly delicate, um, especially if they're going on to be table olives. You don't want to damage the skin as much as possible. Um, so yeah, it's still very common to have hand harvested olives despite their huge production numbers all over the world. Um, so like I said, green olives or olives fresh from the tree are, are just inedible. I mean, they're, they're just extremely bitter. Um, this compound, which I'm, I always butcher pronunciation, so I, I have to have help. Alerpine. 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 <laughs> um, is the, the sugar common, compound that's found in olives that is, yeah, it's, it's just extremely bitter. Um, if, if you've ever tried to single out, you know, the five taste sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Bitter can be one that's kind of hard for people to identify, um, but raw olives, um, pure caffeine is extremely bitter. Um, so, it's it's a uniquely bad taste <laughs> what what a green olive is um so to get rid of that this is where the curing process comes in and has for thousands of years um what's interesting to me or, or a, a takeaway i would have people um, get from this is the kind of care and technique and and expertise that goes into curing um Beyond the regional traditional methodologies, it's it, there's a lot more to it than just dumping olives in a vat full of lye and and walking away. Um, most of the time, these large vats need to be regularly rotated and stirred and monitored uh, as the ripening and and curing can happen at different rates. Um, so it to me it. it the whole process is kind of more on par with like a winemaker or a cheesemaker, somebody that has a tactical experience and knowledge of the process to be able to know when it's right or, or what to change to make it right. Um, I have tried making all of that home and it was a miserable, miserable failure. Uh, I ended up with a mush <laughs> in the bottom of a bucket. So I, I do have a personal further appreciation for this. Um, and honestly, the it's it, in much like winemaking and cheesemaking, it is a very simple process where just a lot of things can go wrong if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, we'll get into some of the curing and production methods in just a minute, but um, 
there's not a lot of ingredients. There's not a lot of steps or complicated, uh, you know, things that go into it. It's really just about experience um, that that ensures the final product is going to be delicious and marketable and, and something that you'd want to eat, <laughs> unlike my experience. Um, so there are a few different types of curing methods. Um, kind of the first one to talk about would be an unfermented green olive. So um, a immature, not quite ripe olive off of the tree uh, that um, is not fermented by the uh, any of the other means we'll get into. Um, and what this yields uh, by having uh, keeping the fer fermentation low, the sugars that are in the fruit, while that, that bitter compound um, is broken down, it, the sugars remain and the, the olives themselves um, are very subtle. They have kind of a sweet, buttery, fresh quality to them. They tend to be a little firmer texture-wise. Um, they are not quite as acidic as some of the, the other methods um, or salty for that matter. Um, the best example, I think the Casa Veltrano olives, which have become widely available, are they're really approachable. Um, so I would say for people who may not think they like olives or know they don't like Kalamata olives, this is a very different item and product and um, I think is a good kind of gateway to what uh, other olives there are out there and, and what flavors there can be. Um, so can I give Castle Voltronos a try. One thing about them, because they're not, they're, the acidity of them is a little bit lower. They need to be kept refrigerated. Um, most olives, um, especially if they're sealed in their container, have a high enough acidity or or salt component that they are shelf stable. Um, quality wise, you generally want to keep them refrigerated, but they don't turn bad quite as fast as any other fruit that you'd leave on the counter. Um, Casa Veltranos though, um, definitely need to be kept refrigerated um, because they have the higher sugar content uh, and lower acidity. Um, from there, there's what's known as the oxidized black olives. Um, this is if you think of the olives you put on your finger, or there's something called Cherignola olives, which are very large, uh, meaty olive, um, kind of uh, thin skin, really a softer texture. These are oxidized black olives. So they're a mature olive. Um, allowed to be on the tree uh, up until that dark purple stage. Um, and then through a process that was developed in California in the missions that were there during the 1800s, um, they are cured in a solution that um, contains an iron oxide. Um, and that helps break down that, that bitter compound um, and when exposed to air, it, it turns black. Um, so they have, you know, typically a, a very mild flavor. They're not briny or sour, like um, a vinegar quality to them. Um, another really approachable style of olives. Um, and most of the time, because they're so meaty and, and, and such a substantial olive, they're, they're really satisfying, is what the sense that I get from them. Um, yeah, I really like the, the Cherignola, which are, we sometimes have green. Most of the time we have this oxidized black. Um, but those are another one that uh, widely, largely available um, and easy to, easy to like. Um, then there's 
fermented green. Um, so this is definitely the most popular style of curing and most available type of olive. Um, it's really a style that originated in Spain. Um, and this is where uh, lye is used to reduce the bitterness in the olives. So the olives are treated with like a brine with lye in it. Sometimes they're packed um, and it's like a paste almost, um, and then allowed to ferment for a period, um, a month, two months. It just depends um, on the olives, on the end result. Um, and then once they're washed after the uh, fermentation style cycle goes through, um, they're perfectly edible. The skin uh, tends to break down a little bit um, from the lye, which allows a lot more of that bitter compound to leach out. And it's, it's almost imperceptible with these often between the skin and the, the flesh. Um, so sometimes olives, you'll get kind of a nice pop. Rarely, in my experience at least, is there a, a big difference with the green olive, the fermented green olives and, and those that have more of a skin intact to them. Um, so yeah, these you frequently find stuffed, um, just generally labeled as pitted green um, in mixes and things like that uh, with other olives. Uh, like I said, definitely the most popular style of fermentation. Um, and yeah, in, in terms of um, consumer preference, people like olives with stuff in them. So this is the way you go about getting that. Um, and then the fermented mature olive. So this is where Kalamatas come in. Um, these are the ones that are harvested later uh, in the, the maturity cycle. So on the tree, they're, they're, they look like this. They're, they're darker color, they're purple, they're, they're brown, they're black. Um, and they're placed in a, a salty brine and allowing, allow the natural yeast and flora um, that are present to kind of consume that bitter compound um, and the sugars that uh, are present in the olives. So this process takes a lot longer than all the others. Um, usually it's, yeah, four to six month um, timeframe for the fermentation to fully complete, during which time the monitoring is really important because it's just kind of uh, allowing the yeast and the flora to uh, do their job within a certain constraint. You don't want it to kind of to run wild and over ferment. Typically it stops once the acidity of, of the brine gets to a certain point, it'll kill off all the yeast and things. Um, but getting that to happen at every level of a big vat is where it's um, Im important to monitor and, and know what you're doing and um, have an idea about uh, what, what's going on where. Um, so these are typically what people think of with olives, I think. In my, my experience, they, they tend to be fairly strong flavored, um, oftentimes um, packaged in, if not a brine, like a vinegar base. Um, so they have a bite, they have a saltiness, they have kind of a sour quality. Um, you know, the olives themselves uh, can really range in terms of their texture. Um, depending on how ripe they were or what, how fermented they got. So sometimes they can be a little mushy. Sometimes they can have uh, a little more al dente texture to them. Um, but these are on the higher end of the flavor spectrum in terms of like intensity. Um, and yeah, what, what I, I feel like most of the time that I've interacted with people who say they don't like olives, this is what they're thinking of um, and is, is very different from everything else we've talked about. 
Um, a few other notes about Kalamanas, um, specifically, they're, they are a type of olive. Um, they're known as Kalaman in Greece. That's the, the name of the varietal, like the species of the olive. Um, whereas the, the port city that they're produced near is Kalamata. Um, so the rest of the world knows them as Kalamata being where they came from. In Greece, they call them Kalaman because that's what they are. Um, but it is, uh, Greece is not a big place for one thing. Um, it's a, roughly the size of Alabama, but all Kalamanas come from Greece. Um, at least all Kalaman come from, or Kalamanas come from Greece as a uh, designation of European law. So there are uh, different levels of uh, geographic designation for food that the European Union recognizes and hopes everyone else would. Um, Kalamata olives fall into that and all Kalamata olives have to come from this region of Greece here in, in the Peloponnese. Um, so as ubiquitous, widely available and, and predominant as Kalamatas are, it's pretty amazing to me that out of a you know country the size of Alabama, they all come from you know one town in in the the, the size that a place that size. So um, always look for the sharp pit on your Kalamana Kalaman olives. Um, they have this kind of tapered shape to them, um, and the pit inside is is very sharp as opposed to some of the other olives, which have more rounded pits or um, just don't have that, that sharpness to them. Um, so it can be hard to distinguish just at first glance, what, what is a Kalamata? Why is it any different? Um, but these examples here kind of illustrate that unique almond or pointed shape that a Kalamata Kalamata has these coquillo olives are, are really tiny. So Kalamata kind of fall in the middle. They're a little bit bigger than the ones in the here and a little bit smaller than the Alfonso olives. Um, they do typically have a noticeable uh, difference between the skin and, and the pulp. Um, something, yeah, that, that will kind of give you a snap to it sometimes. Um, but yeah, Kalamatas are pretty important to Greece and uh, as a, a protective designation uh, product. Uh, the last type of curing that you'll find out there uh, is what's called dry cured. Um, this originated in Morocco and um, Africa. Uh, the fruit is layered with uh with salt um it's uh yeah dry cured or salted olive sometimes it's called um so just layer of fruit salt on top layer of fruit salt on top um until the salt naturally breaks down the uh, bitter compounds um and dries out the olives um these once that happens the olives are typically um dressed, like there's uh, uh, oil with herbs added to them, sometimes fruit, um, to kind of give back some of the, the moisture uh, that was lost in the curing process. Um, and these I find to be really the, the, the strongest flavor-wise of olives. These are my favorite style. Um, it's a really concentrated, earthy, obviously salty flavor, um, but the the olives retain a lot of their uniqueness um, and there can be really interesting um, fruity characteristics that uh, come across depending on the, the style of the producer, what the dressing was. Um, and yeah, again, something to really, you, you got to know what you're doing or what you're working with to get an end result that's worth it. Um, a lot of the times the questions we get um, revolve around pitted or unpitted olives and whether one's better than another or 
if there are any intrinsic differences between the two. Um, and the answer is not really. For me, it just has to do with the amount of processing that goes into it. You know, if it comes off the tree, goes through a curing process, and then is on my table, great. Um, if there's one or two more steps involved there, just for the sake of me not having to spit out a pit, eh, you know, I, I'll opt for the the less processed version just just because it's less processed. Um, but that doesn't mean that pitted olives aren't as good as unpitted olives. Really, the biggest difference is um, pitted olives generally have to be a certain size um, just for the mechanical means of pitting to be worthwhile. Um, those little coqui olives that we saw a couple of slides ago, I mean, they're very tiny, about the size of a pea. Um, and while they, we do occasionally get them pitted, there's just there's just not much left after after they get pitted. So um, there's a convenience factor for sure. And certainly some pitted olives are better suited to certain applications than unpitted. But if I'm just having olives at home um, or serving them to guests or, or in a lot of cases using them in recipes, I will opt for pitted or uh, unpitted olive. Um, of note too, there is um, a certain tolerance for um, allowable pit fragments in pitted olives. So the, the FDA regulates that any pitted olive has to have 98.7% um, uh, no pits, but that does leave for a little more than 1% pit fragments. So even if you have pitted olives, be careful. There may be little bits of pits or an occasional one that was missed. Um, that's just the nature of the game. Um, and certain companies, and that actually that 1.3% is, is pretty high. Most companies, at least the Whole Foods works with, um, aim to be well below that, that number. Um, if I remember right, our main supplier comes in around the half a percent mark. Um, and they have this three-step inspection process for their pitted olives where after it goes through their pitting process, it's manually inspected. Then there's an like, electronic inspection that uses special light. Um, and then it, they're floated off. So the, the olives will float the pit. Any pits will sink before they're packaged up. So um, this is what I mean about processing. None of these things harm the olive. None of, none of them are, are necessarily make one better than the other. Uh, I just don't mind a pit that much. <laughs> um, in terms of storage, uh, another good, another question we get asked quite a bit, um, you know, the olives we have are refrigerated. Um, they don't necessarily need to be in most cases, um, with some exceptions, um, which, you know, are, are clearly pointed out. Um, but it, they should be kept with their brine um, for any more than three days if, if they're going to be stored, um, whether they're submerged or, you know, mainly mostly covered with with uh, brine that will help keep them safe. Um, and then refrigeration will will all but ensure that they are at their best quality for whatever extended period of time that may be. Um, so yeah, I mean, I admittedly have access to a lot of olives um, and, and fresh olives in rotation. So um, I typically buy what I need um, and don't have a lot of, of different olives like sitting around. Um, but having a jar of olives in your back, back of your fridge for months at a time shouldn't be a concern. Um, in doing so, if that if olives become, you know, a pantry staple, a regular part of your diet, I think that's great. Um, they are really versatile, uh, whether they're accompanying um, a cheese board or a vegetable platter, um, just a great snack item. I've actually seen a uh, trail mix with olives in them. Um, the uh, 
the bell, the Moroccan olives um, I've seen in with like nuts and crackers and things all mixed into a trail mix, which is really good. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, tapenade is a great way um, to get olives into your diet, to experiment with olives. Um, typically it's made with olives, capers, um, anchovies a lot of times, herbs and spices. Um, and it, it's it's just really versatile. Um, this website, uh, veggiechick.com, here are 20 fantastic <laughs> uses of tapenade. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, using it as a dip is, is pretty common. Putting it in your salad, on your pizzas, um, especially like a, a spread on a sandwich is a fantastic way to, to get olives um, and eat tapenade. Um, I think this was an interesting comment too here, using these pepidou peppers, which have kind of a sweet tangy quality to them and adding that into what is otherwise like a savory dish or uh, is really interesting. So even adding seasonal fruit into a tapenade can be really interesting um, and delicious, almost like a salsa. Um, so yeah, definitely tapenade is, is a great thing to know about and experiment with, I would say, um, especially if you are learning to like olives or want to eat more olives. Um, it's, it's easy to make. Um, there's plenty of good uh, examples off of there. This, this one is from our olive bar. Um, so yeah, olives, top and on, can't say enough. Oh yeah, shelf life here. Um, this was from a website fitability. Uh, but yeah, I mean, even beyond the best by date, uh, many olives unopened in their liquid um, will be good for some, some places will, will comment up to 18 months beyond what they're dated for. So um, they have a very good shelf life, especially if they're kept cold, if they're kept in their salty water, their brine. Um, Certain things, you know, if it's stuffed, if it's full of cheese or a pepper or something, that's going to uh, decrease the uh, shelf life, um, owing to the fact that it's another thing to go bad. Um, but really, olives are pretty hardy, um, pretty easy to maintain and, and keep fresh and enjoy without noticing significant quality differences from you know, one month to the next. Um, and yeah, that's really um, I, what I have to say about olives. I would encourage everybody to try some um, at Whole Foods. I mean, we have, like I said, our, our olive bar is pretty extensive with olives and other Mediterranean fare. Um, there's, I, I honestly lost count, um, but there's more than 30 across the store, whether jarred or from our olive bar, um, olives to try. And I, we're very happy to like encourage people to try things and, and um, ask for help on how to use them and, and where we like to use things. So I think there's an olive for every taste. I think they're a great thing to have around. I think, you know, being able to connect yourself to what is thousands of years of human history in in a agricultural product like this is is really important and kind of fun so um, definitely get out there and try some olives um, and come tell me about it I want to hear all about what you're doing with olives out there thank you Nick I have a question my yeah. favorite are olives stuffed with almonds sure yeah I just want to say they're kind of hard to come by yeah, but, we ha have them currently, but yeah. uh, they are getting hard to come by. Uh, um, and, and yeah, just oh. real quick, uh, uh, another takeaway would be the, the agricultural nature of olives, um, especially with something like the almond stuff. I mean, you're then dealing with two different crops that have to come together um, and get to the store. So we do frequently find ourselves out of olives because they're they didn't have enough they we we sold out of a, a whole crop mm -hmm. um, and i i think you know 
the world being what it is today, mm -hmm. that's becoming more and more common. Um, but, you know, rather than be a deterrent or, or something to bemoan, there, there's lots of other things out there. So while we mm -hmm. may have trouble getting those little French olives that are so great, there's a Spanish equivalent or some other thing there that mm -hmm. is, is worth trying and substituting for. So mm -hmm. um, bearing in mind that there are people out there growing these things and, you know, processing them to get to us. Um, yeah, just uh, bear with it. <laughs> yeah. And you were talking about uh, harvesting olives. Mm. We were talking about social media. I was just, it was interesting how they actually, how they are harvested in modern days. It looks like a, a tractor. It approaches yeah. the tree and yeah. unfolds what looks like an um, upside down umbrella. Exactly. And spreads yeah. it under the tree and grabs it by a fork and then yep. shakes it. And they it's all the land tree. in, I mean, it, I've never seen it. It was very fascinating. Yeah, it is. It's it's really, yeah, pretty ingenious, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Because think... how else would you do it? Because the, before they had to put sheets under the tree and hit exactly. it with a stick. Like hit you it with said. a stick, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But then I have a question. You were saying the main nut nut nutrient in uh, olives is the vitamin E, but right. olive oil is omega-3s. Yeah. Do so... you know if olives also have omega-3s? Um, so they do, um, but I think where the difference comes in is the concentration level. Mm -hmm. So whereas olive oil is is the pressed, you know, distilled is the wrong word, but concentrated version of mm -hmm. olives, that's what you you get a lot more of it in olive oil than you do in individual olives. So mm -hmm. it's definitely still present, um, but you'd have to eat an awful lot of olives to get mm. the same, you know, in a serving of olive oil. Mm. And I like writing the culinary literacy blog I write, kind of educating our, or in, I mean, kind of giving, provide information to patrons about nutritional value, especially in our community. Yeah. And uh, I'm just writing on also on olive tepanade, and olive oil, and I, mm -hmm. I I do research before I write it, so it's not just you know things I just make up. But right. they were saying how we are supposed to eat two tablespoons of olive oil per day because of the omega three fatty acids. And right. they said in Mediterranean diet, they you know the per capita they use eight gallons of olive oil. I cannot wow. imagine, you know. I mean, I have like two bottles a year, right. you know. <laughs> you know, maybe more, but eight gallons a year of olive oil. It's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think what's important about that referencing the uh nutritional component of certain compounds like that adding olives into a diet, um, you will get some of that, those important compounds and vitamins and, and nutrients um, without really trying, you know? Uh, I mean, you could certainly drink two teaspoons of olive oil every day, but getting a little bit of it from olives or using your tapenade, which will have oil in it and yeah. little stacking things like that, I think it's a much more accessible way for most people to um, to get those nutritional benefits without trying too hard, really. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it's two tablespoons. Table it's two spoon. tablespoons. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I just bought a big bucket from your olive bar recently for this coming weekend, and I I did I don't know that, but you mentioned it. The names of the red peppers. Oh uh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and then the cornichons. Sure. And yeah. uh, I also like the. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and so what is the difference between smaller red peppers and the large red peppers? Yeah, so these up here are, are called pepidus. Um They, they are sweet, from, right? Yeah, they have kind of a tangy, sweet, um, piquant sort of flavor to them. Uh -huh. um, they, yeah, bigger size. They, they come from South Africa. Um, and then these ones here are they come from peru um they're 
a pearl pepper or they have a bird name. I can't remember the like Spanish language name. Um, they're not quite as sweet for one thing. They do have a little bit more of a spiciness to them, but not by any means. I mean, less than a jalapeno, just mm -hmm. comparatively. Mm -hmm. um, they have a, a little bit of a spice to them mm -hmm. um, and a little, they're a little more, mm, phrase it. Uh, I guess vegetal mm -hmm. is, is kind of the, they, they taste, whereas the pepidou have that like ripe, sweet fruit mm -hmm. character to them. The, the Peruvian ones are a little more kind of green tasting. Mm -hmm. um, uh and I also bought the pickled pearl onions. I hope they taste as good as the ones my father used to make. Uh, <laughs> and me too. Yeah, I have to, uh, They are very good. Yeah. Are, do they have balsamic vinegar on them or yeah. why are they so brown? Yeah, they have a balsamic um, brine, um, which it comes across as very sweet with the olive. I mean, yeah. pickling well, of them. Me. Well, good. I mean, it's it's a. Pr I mean, I just I just realized I just bought a, a container the other day. Well, thank I you. think that's it. I, well, thank you so much. Looking forward to uh, us getting together again for another program. On actually, it's on the tenth. It's the mm -hmm. olive oil class, and the twenty fourth. I misspoke. It's a chocolate class we have coming. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. It was great to have you here and uh, see you again next month. Thank great. you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.